Good morning. Oh, good morning. Lord have mercy. I need to go to sleep. <laughs> good evening. <clears throat> good evening. Good evening. I trust that everyone is doing well tonight. Um, we are. Um, I'm trying something new at the moment. And uh, currently we are, uh, should be live streaming on the channel as well. I'm not exactly sure how that's working, but we're going to see how that works. I'm going to give people a few more moments to come on. Just a few more moments to come on. People should be clicking their Zoom uh, things right now. I don't know how to This is behind. Oh, there it is right there. Good evening. Elder Murphy, if you would do me a favor, we're also live and in effect on YouTube as well. This is Elder Blanks hitting me up right now. Uh, where's the link, sir? <laughs> I'm sending it to him right now. I said that thing. I think I sent it already, didn't I? To him. I did. Okay. All right. Okay. Hello, everybody. I wanted to do something a little different, something a little bit more personal, and get online with, with my church and uh, love on you some more. Uh, Y'all get to see me in the war room today and to uh, kind of hear your questions and entertain those. We've, we've talked a lot. We've had a lot of information, whether it be from Ignite or whether it be from our masterclass or whatever it has been, there's been a lot of questions that we've been having uh, that, I know people have, that I know people have. And so I want to make sure that people are getting their questions answered as well. I most certainly want to do that. And I, won't, I don't want to uh, forego that. A lot of times in Bible class or whatever, Sunday morning, we don't ask, we don't, we don't get the opportunity to ask the questions that, uh, that we have. And I think that if we're going to be successful at raising people up, I think we ought to take the time to answer those questions, whether they be tough questions or, or not. We need to answer them. We need to provide biblical answers for those questions, as well as we need to be able to, uh, the Bible says this, it says that, we, that when somebody proposes us with a question, we ought to be able to propose them with an answer. We ought to be able to answer them appropriately at all times. And so we want to be able to do that. And so this is kind of one of those, one of those things where, where we're kind of touching this a little differently. Okay. Uh, as I said, I'm waiting on, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to wait on people to get on, but I'm also making sure that people who are on, on another platform or, or maybe on, on another platform are getting the, the opportunity to, uh, in the opportunity to uh, watch and to be a part of this as well. And so uh, we are doing uh, just that, okay? We're doing just that, letting people get the opportunity to get on and, and so on and so forth. Um, in case you did not know, I'm also live streaming this particular um, uh, Zoom on uh, our Boxcast channel as well. 
So uh, you all have the opportunity to see it there. It's always also being broadcast on our YouTube channel also. Uh, and I think it should be going out to, to Facebook Live. Yeah, on all it's going out on all channels. Same way it would normally go out any other way. So uh, there are those that may be on, um, on uh, YouTube that are watching. Let me know that you're there. We have somebody watching out for your questions there, as well as we will have someone watching out for your questions on Facebook Live. All right, so let's get to work. I have people that are on this line right now uh, who are watching, and I know you probably have a myriad of questions, and I want to hear them all. Don't squander the moment. Ask your questions. It doesn't matter what the question is, uh, how the question is phrased, ask it. All right, ask it, no matter what it is, just ask it. We want to make sure that everybody is has the opportunity to ask a question and answer, uh, have that question answered as well, okay? So without further ado, I have my phone set here for any incoming uh, YouTube stuff. Elder Murphy's probably watching Facebook as well. And so I wanna give you the opportunity to ask a way, ask a way, ask a way. Questions, 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 here they go. Hi Maggie, how are you? Maggie's on on YouTube. I see her. I don't know who's on on um, Facebook Live, but uh, we're gonna be good to do that. Now, y'all, now I've had this whole doggone thing here, and ain't nobody raising a question. Somebody better ask a question, cause I ain't got no message tonight, so you ain't getting nothing. <laughs> Y'all better ask a, ask a question or something before I just get just start talking. Praise God. Amen. I just start talking. So. All right, you got, I don't know what other work he's doing. I think he's just swinging something around. I thought he was trying to get my attention. What's us uh, Facebook Live looking like, Murph? Four people viewing on. Uh, are you watching uh, on on YouTube, Murph? Shake your head. Okay, I'll come off then, cause that way it'll be able to show you how many people are actually watching versus. Uh, yeah, I'll be able to show you people who's who's actually watching. Okay, we got people on YouTube watching. Ask your questions. Ask away. Y'all don't give me like this all the time. I'm in the office, so y'all don't give me all like this. Yeah, I can hear you, Miss Ingrid. I wasn't going to say anything tonight, believe it or not. I was going to let everybody else talk. <laughs> but I just wanted to open the floor because, you know, some people be like, I don't want to be the first one. So I'll yeah. be the first one. Can you just speak on... Um, I know we were talking about warfare. So can you speak on warfare with dream vision and that nature? Mm -hmm. When you when we deal with the comment with the, the, the subject matter of uh, and this idea of, of warfare, the enemy will commonly, when it comes to seers and dreamers, will commonly infiltrate their dream world. And we got to understand that the dream world is a byproduct of the imagination. It is the screen of the imagination that is shown upon in the nighttime or if you have an open vision in the daytime and so on and so forth. Now, the, the attack that he wages is not always external. It's not always external. There are things that are at work on the inside of us, unfortunately, that he utilizes as uh, a uh, base of, of military operations. He can use that as a base to to launch levels of attack. You got it? 
to launch levels of attack and to make sure that our dreams are jacked up. So he infiltrates that and he begins to use imagery that's familiar to you. And he begins to use the meaning of symbols that's familiar to you to be able to craft a dream, okay? And or manipulate one that you're currently having to be able to make a suggestive message to you, whether that be a message of fear, whether that be to reinforce what's on the inside of you. A lot of times we deal with dreams. Dreams always kind of, kind of speak to what's on the inside of us in the first place. The world of our dreams are ultimately at a subconscious and even unconscious level speaking to something that's at work on the inside of us. And so if you're constantly having dreams with a, a, with a certain person in it or with a certain scenario going on, then that has to be interpreted so that we can deduce, is this an attack from the enemy or is this your soul crying out for deliverance? Mm. Okay. Or is it your soul crying out for deliverance? Because if your soul is crying out for deliverance, it's going to create the world on the imagination <laughs> that says and suggests exactly what it is that uh, is going on inside of it. Okay. And it is from there that we can really begin to deal with, with that stuff. That's how, that's how we, uh, we touch, uh, that's how they touch the dreams. Now, if you want a war, warfare, uh, want a warfare uh, in the dream world, all right, uh, that's a whole nother different thing. John Paul Jackson talked about lucid dreaming, and I was just watching this a couple of days ago, oddly. He was talking about lucid dreaming and how lucid dreaming is that ability to take control in the dream and exercise levels of authority. All right. Um, so it's this whole idea of kind of consciously remembering that you have authority. All right. Or when you wake up from the dream, if, you, if you're not lucid dream, when you wake up from the dream, immediately seeking Holy Spirit for the meaning of the dream so that it does not settle in you in a, in a, in a negative way. That's critical. The reason why that's critical is because most people, what they will do is when they'll have a dream, they won't write it down. They won't pray against it. They won't, they won't seek intelligence from the Holy Ghost as to what they ought to do. Neither will they ask, you know, how am I supposed to deal with this? We just want to go back to sleep. But there, there's, there's a message in the dream. What is it speaking? What is it saying? And, and most of the time it's because we don't know how, we don't know what questions that we ought to ask. And when we don't know what questions we ought to ask, it puts us at a gross disadvantage, a gross disadvantage as it relates to what it is that we, that the dream world. Now, there's a difference between a suggestive dream and, a, and an attack, because an attack is an, is an attempt to gain territory inside of your soul by, and, and usually the attack is also waged internally from the inside. OK, and it's to gain territory. So if most of the time the enemy will, will, will literally try to attack you with fear, OK, fear of this and fear of that. And fear usually is the tactic that he will use to gain, to gain territories on the inside of the soul and to prohibit those individuals from wanting to dream again. Nightmares are just that. They, they're, in, they're, they're installations of fear on the inside of the soul. OK, did that help? OK, all right. Anybody else? Lord, these lights are blinding me. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Y'all got me now with all these questions. I guess for, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So for myself, um, as a worship leader, and we're on the track of warfare, I guess, how do we wage war within the worship service or um, just worship in general? Mm, good question. Um, we have to understand that warfare is not just our prayer. Okay. Uh, David wrote Psalms, you know, that were Psalms of war. Teach my hands to, my fingers to fight in my, my, my hands to fight in my fingers to war, whatever, whichever way it was. But that's how that really begins to be lifted up. Okay. And so creating songs of war for the season. Allowing the Holy Spirit to speak prophetically so that songs of war can be sung. Okay. Uh, we, were, we were just kind of engaged in this as it relates to music. When music is, when you have music, music will kind of dictate the song. 
uh, that needs to be released. And, and wherever we are in a season, you know, listening to the prayer that we're having, listening to the word that's being preached, and then raising up song that will do battle against the very things that we're preaching, okay? Or do battle with and against the enemy. So if, if, if I just preached on, on time, on last week, right? And we talked about how uh, we talked about how um, people may may not spend time with the Lord. Okay, well, this, there's a song of the Lord that can come forth out of that. You see what I'm saying? All right, there there's a there's a song of the Lord that can come forth out of that. Okay, I got I got a question from Auntie Sheila. And she asked the question of, explain more about demonic technology that is birthed in the heart. When we talk about a demonic technology that is birthed in the heart, we have to remember that the heart is a repository of all of our experiences, all of our, all of the happenings, all of the encounters, all of the tragedies, all of the traumas, good and bad, okay? And so what the enemy does is he takes the raw material of things that we've gone through, all right? And he utilizes that to weave together to weave together or utilize technology and weaves those things together as a force against us, all right? When we start speaking about demonic technologies, um, whether they be fear, whether they be rejection or whatever the case may be, we got to understand that those technological innovations have been used, are, are used against us. They're birthed in our hearts. They utilize, they, they begin to utilize our particular uh, experiences and encounters that we go through and they utilize them to trigger different aspects of the soul okay they utilize them to trigger different aspects of the soul and so in this i'm in a study right now uh where i'm looking at at rejection and and the a behavioral profile of rejection what does how do rejected people behave how do people that operate in fear behave and if we're going to deduce and and understand fear uh uh if we're gonna understand and deduce fear, how then does gripping fear work? What's the behavior behind that? How then does uh, uh, horror, dread, trepidation, cowardice, how do those things work, okay? And what, what behaviors do they cause? And so when we talk about the, that them being birthed in the heart, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he becomes. So what is, whatever is in the heart, that's what, that's what that man then becomes, all right? That's what that man then becomes. They, they become, begin to manifest that, okay? I got one more about auntie. Auntie asked the question of how does an excuse rob my potential? Well, this is how an excuse robs the potential. Simply because when you have the ability to and the capacity to do it and we make the excuse, God is trying to stretch us many times with the things that he's asking us to do. Sometimes it's not that God just, it, it, it is that God wants our obedience but a lot of times it's God wants to stretch us through our experiences. Uh, case in point, let's look at the, at the pandemic. We have a whole pandemic here. And, you know, a lot of people are, are, are fighting and, oh, my God, we're in a pandemic. What about this and what about that? And, and even though it's not ordained by God but sanctioned by him, we have to, as the church, ask the question, how is this thing speaking to us what is what is it saying what are we here to learn all right so if i make an excuse say well you know we can't we, we can't live stream because we ain't got or we we can't live stream that's just too difficult i made the excuse but i've robbed myself of the potential for the kingdom of god to reap benefits grab people do the work of the kingdom because i'm afraid and i gave an excuse or I don't want the responsibility that comes behind that. Excuses require you to give over responsibility, okay? And when we give over responsibility to something, all right? Uh, yeah, like when we use what is stored to make make in the fridge to make a meal, exactly. You know, when we when we when when we you know shirk our responsibilities, that's God can't utilize that to stretch us, okay? We don't get the luxury of, 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 of God telling us or we telling God how 
we want to how we want to do this thing. You know, I want you to do, I want you to stretch me this way because it's comfortable. No, 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 no. He's going to take the situation and circumstance that you're in and give you the opportunity to do something greater. And then that stretches your capacity. Okay. Once you have your capacity stretched, you now realize that you can do something that you could not do before. Okay. So I've, I've been through a couple of situations in my day and each of them, I would not like to go through again. Let's just be real with it. I, I just would not like to go through those things again. Okay. So the whole idea is this, that my capacity has been stretched. I learned a lesson from it. If I have to go through it again, I won't make the excuse of, I can't do this. I can, I can go right ahead and say, hey, I, I got this. I got this. We're going we're gonna to make it through here. Okay. All right. Somebody asks, let me see what this says here. Can you talk more about the capacity and how to stretch it? Oh, boy. When we start talking about capacity, now, now it's just like asking God for patience here. When you ask God for patience, what he's going to do is he's going to send you through some stuff that's going to cause you to exercise patience. So when we talk about stretching capacities, stretching capacities means he's not dealing with your abilities. Okay. Ability and capacity is one is two different things. Ability deals with, with more so what you can do. All right. Capacity says what you can hold, what you can handle. So when God starts to expand your capacity, he's dealing more so in the arena of responsibilities. Okay, he wants to know, he wants to show you that you can handle responsibility. You can handle the weight and the pressure of what's being put on you. That's how he wants to do that. Okay, and so how he stretches it, situations and circumstances, he utilizes them. Even though hell meant them for bad, that's what text meant when, when what, what hell meant for bad, God turns it around for your good. Because the thing that was meant and designed literally to hinder, stop, and oppose you has now been used for your, for your good. Okay, now you become a force to be reckoned with because my capacity is stretched. Now I can receive more. I can handle more. I can endure more. Okay, and I just won't break under the pressure every time it happens. Okay. Who else? We have anything from from our from our Facebook uh, uh, people or no? I'm not there. I'm not on Facebook. So if if we do, uh, somebody just just let me know what they are, and I'll answer them. I'll answer them. Come on, y'all! All y'all intelligent people with all these questions. Either I am a prolific teacher where y'all have no questions, or we just got the bad uh, spirit of fear. Come on. You are excellent in teaching the possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> but a quick question. Yeah. Um, warfare and the prophetic. Can mm. we speak on that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Warfare and the prophetic. <laughs> uh, prophets have been made as warriors just by nature. They're, they're made as warriors. You can look at at all throughout scripture, the prophets and, and the apostles were, were warriors. War, war was built into their makeup. Okay, war was built into their makeup. And so what that means is, is that by nature, prophetic people are gonna be subject to warfare attacks and warfare attempts on their life and on their destiny because the enemy does not want them to utilize the full capabilities or capacity of the prophetic graces that may be on them, whether that be a, prof a prophet's office, the gift of prophecy, or an adjunct prophetic function. Prophets and prophecy, and even prophesying, is a warfare against the enemy. In prayer, when you have, sometimes you will have prayer as prophecy, and I think I talked about that. That's probably one of the 12 dimensions of prayer. I don't know if Minister Hancock is on, but she remembers all of them. Uh, but that when you start to deal with that, and you have the prophets that are coming in during times of intercession. I probably would structure it as 
we would have chief intercessor start off and go into intercession, have the music going in behind, and then release the first round of prophets to go forth and prophesy the word of the Lord and, and declare and to decree. And that then becomes warfare just as much as prayer does. All right. We'd have the seers seeing and the and those that are that are that, that are subject to having visions now there as well to be able to come up and share what these warfare tactics and, and strategies are now doing in the realm of the spirit. But pro, pro, but prophetic people are always under attack. The enemy, the enemy does not want them to uh I don't want to say prosper, but for lack of a better word, the enemy does not want them as a effective tool in the kingdom of God. He doesn't want them that way. So he attacks them. You're going to find that prophetic people struggle with rejection. They struggle with insanity. They struggle with depression. They struggle with uh, fear issues, all types of stuff. And I mean, this is across the board when we deal with believers, but the general idea is, is that you will find that they struggle with this a whole lot more because the attack is so real for them, because the release of their gift is so vicious against the kingdom of darkness, okay? Just like the decrees of an apostle or an, or an apostolic uh, grace or an adjunct apostolic function, when they begin to make decrees and declarations and navigate and move in the realm of the spirit, then the kingdom of darkness has, has, has no has no chance if that makes any sense so yes when you start dealing with the prophetic i, I think prophetic song is 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 a, a prophetic psalmistry let me say that prophetic psalmistry is a, a stream of warfare prophetic minstrels okay who begin to play the song and the sound of war let's talk about that for a minute the song and the sound of war songs deal with lyrics sounds deal with what music right song deals with lyrics sounds deal with music so we need the song of war, but we also need the sound of war. And every sound of war is not boom, 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 boom. It's not always it. They didn't do boom, 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 boom in Jericho. Okay, they shouted one time, and stuff happened. The beat that we're used to hearing that we're calling warfare a lot of the times is one that is culturally contexted. It comes out of our Ashanti and Zulu. And the thick bass beat that's on the inside of us. You take bass, you take warfare over into, you know, our Caucasian counterparts, it sounds different. Or into our, 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 our Latin American brothers and sisters, it sounds different. Now, if they have somebody from an African American persuasion that's in their musical department, it's going to come out of them that way. Okay. So we need that. We need poems that are that, that are profit that are uh, a warfare. Okay, because of the power of words. What happened to, to warfare poets? Okay, people like my mother who are, who are playwrights. We need her to begin to write plays of warfare. Okay, we don't just want to have those plays that just say, oh, yeah, here's a problem. God will solve it. Everybody ends up okay at the end. No, we want some stuff that's written in such a way that it literally begins to war against the, against the, uh, against the, 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 the stuff that's attacking the minds of God's people. We need those playwrights. We need those scribes, okay? We just don't need psalmists and minstrels, okay? We need the prophets to stand up and prophesy warfare prophecy and to release prophetic decrees. We need the seers to come and let us know what's happening in the realm of the spirit. We need the intercessors to come and pray and to and the elders to come and wail and so on and so forth at the altar and the and the and the and, the, and people to come and weep. All of that is warfare. All of that is warfare. We don't talk about it enough. Maybe for our next prophetic conference. After this one, I'll talk about uh, uh the warfare of the of, of the prophetic. Maybe I'll do that. Let me write that down. I got my notes, my pen, and my, my book is over here. All right, keep keep the questions going. Keep the questions going. All right, I got seven people over here on Zoom with me. I got some more on YouTube. Uh, what is it looking like on uh, on uh, on the on the lives, we got several lives going on live on my page, and on live on the church's page. Um, so uh, here we go. 
what's the best way to fight in a warfare? Maggie asked this question. What's the best way to fight in a warfare? Well, I, I think that the, 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 the way you fight is going to be kind of built into you. Some people are natural are, are natural prayer personalities. They love to pray. Some people are natural worshipers and it's utilizing the thing that comes natural to you, but also being well versed in other methodologies of war. And I'm talking about uh, decrees and declarations. Uh, the courts of heaven, use the courts of heaven uh, uh, as, a, as a tactic to get uh, things happening in, the, in, in, the, in warfare, okay? Uh, the best, I, I don't know if there is a best way and or worst way, but I think it's one that works best for you. For me, I, I like decrees and declarations personally. Uh, I like to utilize the word of God to decree and declare, but also uh, prophetic song. All right. I'm not a singer. Elden, that's Elder Murphy's job. All right. But for me, when I get a certain beat or a certain music, that begins to hit. And if we're in a sea, if we're in a time of war, you'll begin to hear a more aggressive sound come out of me. And I'll begin to sing the song of war. I'll begin to get, there's a, there's a thing that I believe God is doing and wants to do in the earth called war chants, war chants. And a war chant is literally just that. It's declaring the victory uh, 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 over our enemy. It's declaring what we're going to do to our enemy. It is what I like to call supernatural intimidation. <laughs> you begin to intimidate your enemy, okay? You begin to intimidate your enemy by releasing those war chants, okay? So there that is. Keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming. Keep them coming. If you guys are on Zoom and you have a question and you don't want to ask it, out loud, they do have a chat function on here and you're able to utilize the chat function. Also, you got one? I do. Um, this is the, uh, a theological question. Um, I guess for me, what changed your, uh, I, don't want, I guess your theological standpoint from Genesis one and one and one and two, the battle to where you have begun to teach now? Mm. Um, this is me just picking your brain. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a reader. Uh, I don't get a chance to read as much as I would like to, honestly, uh, but I'm a reader. And uh, I ran up upon, I ran up upon, I ran up on a gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser. And, and here, here's the thing, when, when you are studying things like spiritual warfare, that's an abstract concept that does not have a place, as it were, in theology proper. Uh, it does not always have a place in this idea of demonology. That, that's a, that's, that's a, a stream of systematic theology. But you, you have to kind of create a theological construct, okay? You have to uh, create a theological construct as it, as it were. And so when I first started, there were no answers for that question to me. And I listened to ministers uh, who spoke about it and they brought some varying topics up. And so what I did, I went and I studied the ones that they said and the ones that made the most sense I kind of, you know, brought them into this, this semi-finalist round, okay? All right, and so once I, I hit that, I kind of prayed and said, okay, Holy Spirit, what's happening here? Kind of direct me. Now, did I have the skill? I, am, I, I know Greek and Hebrew. I am not a Greek and Hebrew linguist by any stretch of the imagination, all right? I understand the language, but I'm not a, I'm not a linguist by any stretch of the imagination, Dr. Heiser is he has a PhD in uh, Near Eastern languages and culture. So he's bringing out some things that I had read, had speculations about, but the problem was that I had no uh, scripture to substantiate the thought process, okay? Scripture always breeds theology to me, especially if you're sola scriptorium, sola, sola, 
solus, solely scriptorium, scripture, scripture only. All right. And so we lift this idea that, all right, as I'm looking at him, as I'm looking at this, he's bringing to, to, to light some things linguistically and culturally. All right. So if this is how the people in that century understood it, and you're giving me some academic resources to substantiate that, then okay, now I can I can start this process. I can study it on my own, all right? And once I start to study it on my own, then revelation can come. Here we are. The thing about this is, is that God allows for us to build on our understanding, all right? So was I wrong that something happened between Genesis 1 and 1 and 1 and 2? No. No. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, earth with formless and void. Something did happen. <laughs> okay, something did happen. But what we're seeing is, is this whole idea of when it happened. Okay. Now, understanding the words formless and void is a whole nother different ball game in the interpretive process. Was there a war? Did God shut the lights off? If so, why? You know what I'm saying? What? Here's another thought process. Was it formless and void as we understand formless and void? Or was it formless and void meaning that it was th that it that did not possess everything on it that God wanted to have on it? And if it didn't possess that, then it now lifts up this idea that the earth was created perfect, yes, but it was formless and it was what? Void. So now he goes in and this explains Genesis chapter one, verses three, verses three on to the close. And the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, he began to put form to it as such that it was no longer void, okay? So that's what began to change my, my, my theological standpoint, as it were, on that. Okay, that's what began to change that. All right. Uh, Deanna asked the question, can you talk a little bit uh, about warring slash intercession in the midnight hours? Okay, because I got two questions going on. I got Auntie got a question, uh, and Auntie's question was, why are church folks so afraid of spiritual warfare? Let me address that one first. Ignorant. They don't know no better. They don't know. We don't teach this. And if it is being taught, seriously, if we are, if we're not doing a good job at teaching spiritual warfare, we don't teach the fear out of people. We have to teach the fear out of people by empowering them with the information that they need to be successful in the thing that they're afraid of. That's why they're afraid. A lot of them don't want to go against the devil because they've never been taught authority. They've never been taught sonship. They've been taught naming and claiming, it, blabbing it and grabbing. It. And they've not been taught that type of stuff. Okay. Now, let's not talk about prayer in the midnight hours and warring in the mid and, and during the midnight time, that, that time of midnight prayer. Midnight prayer is a whole nother different animal. Because midnight literally is the darkest time of the day. And it is the time where things happen in the realm of the spirit under the cloak of that darkness. And it is because we do not understand how it works. We don't understand why God chose to have the evening and the morning with the first day. All right. And why God set watches there. The reason why he said watches or what, I mean, this is from a very natural perspective, was quite frankly, because we wanted to make sure that every hour or every, every, every you know, watch of the day was sufficiently uh, 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 manned by individuals who are, who are capable of engaging warfare and sounding the alarm. Midnight prayer, even though you may be called to it, you got to be equipped for it. Because if you don't, the enemy will have some strange things happen that'll just, you know, be like, okay, you know what? I'm just not doing this anymore. Okay. You got to be equipped for that. Because at midnight, that's literally where witches and warlocks and things of that nature really begin to engage. They begin to engage the spirit world. That's, that's, that's the time where the spirit world is the most active at midnight. Okay. 
So if we're going to have take, have intercession in the, at, at that hour, then we need to know exactly what we're fighting against. And I think we need to have a well-equipped intercession team, not just a well-equipped intercessor for that time. This is me just being st strategic and tactical. Okay. So if we're, if we're praying for that and during that time, what are we praying? What are we praying for? What are we releasing? What are we utilizing? Okay. What prayer, what, what, what dimension of prayer are we going to be operating in? Okay, we we need to learn how to use the, how how to deal with things that are in the womb of the day and the womb of the night. Okay, we need to be able to deal with things that are in satanic wombs that are gestating. These are things that we handle in the midnight hour. All right, a lot of times it's good to take territory in the midnight hour. Bible says, "Work while it is day, for no man worketh at night." Great strategy. So when you begin to engage in all of that, hey, Janine, miss you much, love. Miss you much. Um, yeah, I am. But that, that's, that's kind of how that is. Okay. That, that's kind of how that is. So when we start to engage in that and in that warfare, we need to be knowing what we're praying for. We need to have, ta we need to have a, strategic, a strategy, tactics, people that are assigned to that particular uh, prayer uh, 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 time as well as how to navigate through that as well. Okay, those are those are critical. Those are critical. I have the word of the Lord for you too, Janine. If you hear me, there are some things that God is getting ready to do for you and Sean. Amen. Come on, where they at? Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Okay, I had a question. Elder Blanks, show me your face. Oh, okay. Let him see your face, sir. That's a little, that's a little dark, but here I am. Hello, go. everyone. Um, anyway, um, yeah, my question was, I, I've, I've been thinking I want to do like an intimacy activation. So my question is mm -hmm. like, what would you suggest as an activation to um, promote intimacy with the father mm. let me talk about activations and then weave my way on into that um okay. activations activations are a innovation that's utilized not just in in the in the body of christ but it's in the world to promote the usage of uh gifts and talents okay um that technology and that innovation was hijacked by the occult world and they started activating people in the dark arts whereas now we're beginning to activate people in the in the things of god okay so now with that being said an an intimacy activation uh would be one that, hmm, it's not a difficult question, but it, it it's, uh, if we're gonna have an intimacy, an intimacy activation. Uh, well, I think first we have to start off with the definition of intimacy and what that is. And if you don't know what that is, you're gonna have to go all the way back to Sonship and, and uh, Minister Shannon Lyle's series on intimacy. You just gotta go back to that. Uh, but when you look at that definition of intimacy, you know, what is that? What, is, what does intimacy mean? Now taking a look at those particular steps and, and cult and creating an intimacy uh, activation around that. I would start off, I would start people off with say, all right, let's, let's engage the presence of God. Let's engage the presence of God. And I would take them through the 12 dimensions of the presence of God. All right, because that's the pathway of relationship, which is also intimacy is leading them through that pathway. And that being, and what that's doing is that's drawing them closer and closer and closer and closer to God. Uh, and it's allowing them to understand that there's, that, there's a, that there's a difference in proximity to his presence. Some of us will ultimately just, just stay outside in the, in, in the I'm not presence of the Lord because we're not trying to be intimate with him. Well, others are, will long after the kabod of God. And that kabod, what does that feel like? You know, defining intimacy, 
or defining those levels in intimacy by the glory of God and, and, and cultivating glory experiences so that they will know what the omnipresence of God feels like, what the manifest presence of God, what the uh, immediate presence of God feels like, what the hod, the kabod, the shekinah, the uh, tipareth, the doxa, and all of those. What do all of those feel like? How, how, what are the characteristics of those? And leading them through there so that they can understand that and then while they're in that presence, or while they're in that particular dimension of the glory, I would have them ask God an appropriate question and or ask them the same questions they keep on going. And you'll find the answer becomes a lot more extensive the closer you get to his mouth. Okay. Keep them rolling. Where they at? Y'all got me to 830. Y'all be wanting me to preach until nine before. Now y'all got questions. We're going to end at eight o'clock. Where y'all at? I have one more. Go ahead on, Miss Ingrid. Talked about um, the creeds and declarations. Mm -hmm. And can you speak on the creeds and declarations? I don't want to say so much into the warfare, but the basis of declarations and decrees Um. I hear so many people decreeing and declaring. Mm. So it almost vexes me to a yeah. certain degree. Mm. <laughs> so can you um, just speak on when you decree and declare, what you're decreeing and declaring, mm. and who are allowed to actually make decrees and declarations? That's good. That's good. OK. Uh, this idea of decrees and declarations, uh, we really begin to deal with this because a, a decree is the statement of the establishment of a law, okay? Declarations deal more so with the, the uh, restatement of a law or in some real senses, the enforcing of a law, okay? Decrees, declarations, all right? And... Uh, Declarations and decrees are appropriate when you have a legal situation. When you start dealing with legalities in the realm of the spirit, you can make a decree in your home. Okay, because you have you have constituted authority there. You can make a decree in your home because you are the authority there. Can you make a decree? into over someone that you don't have authority over? Not necessarily. If I've been assigned to a territory, guess what? I have the authority to make decrees and declarations concerning that territory. If I live in a neighborhood, I have authority to make decrees and declarations concerning that. If I have not been assigned there or I don't live there, then that decree and declaration ability is kind of diminished because I don't have constituted authority. There and people don't like that 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 they can't do stuff because but we have to understand that we there's spheres here. There's spheres of influence and spheres of authority. All right, the, the the Bible talks about measure of reach, measure of reach. How far do your words go? How far do your words go? <laughs> do do your words have the have the juice to go into another nation? If you don't have a national mantle, then the decrees that you make out of your mouth are going to go as far as your mantle will allow. As far as your mantle will allow. Over your family, yes, you have ability to make decrees and declarations. Okay? And edicts. Over your church that you are part of. There we start to get fuzzy. When you start doing that, you better make decrees and declarations that are already being made. Okay? Because... If you are trying to make a decree or declaration over, over a thing that you don't have, again, constituted authority over, then you, your, your decrees and declarations will be used by the enemy. And the only thing that can override a decree or a declaration is another decree or declaration. So when we're praying and when we're doing stuff, we have things that are nullifying each other. Okay, that becomes problematic. So that's that's this whole idea of of friendly fire and collateral damage. Okay, friendly fire and collateral damage. Okay, here we go. Uh, last week you mentioned 
when you mentioned what made David a man after God's own heart, you mentioned it was his, it was a residue on David when he killed Goliath. Was that, was that a reference to the anointing? In one sense, yes, it's a reference to the anointing, but more, more so it was dealing with the time that he spent with God, that God's presence and God's power was on him because of the time that he spent. And so I, I think like this, the more, the, the, the more intimate time you spend with the Holy Ghost, I think the more pungent and powerful that anointing will be. And inside of the anointing, there's an economy. Inside of the anointing, there's an economy. Okay, there are resources that are inside of the anointing. There are things that the anointing has the capacity to do. All right. And uh, when you start to deal with the intimacy portion, uh, that that kind of takes you into it takes you into this idea of purifying the anointing on our lives uh, just because we've been anointed doesn't mean that our anointing cannot be tainted and it can be tainted by stuff in our souls it can be it can be tainted by a myriad of things all right all right there we go uh tyler so good to see you man so good to hear, hear from you man one of my old people man it's been a long time how do you keep a new business on the path of the word? Um, there are business strategies that exist in the word of God itself. Um, be committed to integrity. Be, be committed to personal integrity as well as to exhibiting divine, as, as well as to exhibiting godly character. Okay. That's going to be the first part of it. And the more you submit and surrender your business to the Holy Ghost, he will, guide, he will guide you and direct you and say, okay, that's a good business deal. Don't make that. Or make this one. Don't make that one. Or partner with this person or never partner with that person. God will direct and guide you. And you as the principal leader of the business will be the one that will guide it. Uh, so it, it all starts out with you uh, having great character. And, and having a great relationship with God. Let's go back first, having a great relationship with God yourself. And I'm just talking about just saying, okay, I know Jesus. Okay, well, I know a lot of people, but they don't really know me. Well, I don't know the in-depths about them. So we need to have that intimacy with him so that we give him permission to lead our lives and then by extension, leading our businesses. Okay, we don't know how to let God lead our lives, but we want to lead our businesses. Let him lead your life. Let him take you to marry, where not to go, who to go with, when, <laughs> all that type of stuff. And then as he transforms you, you're going to find that the character and how you run your business is going to be very, very different. Okay. That was good. I like business questions. Y'all don't even tap that part of me. Y'all want to know all the spiritual stuff. Y'all are deep. Y'all are deep. Y'all don't want to know the spiritual stuff. Ask me wisdom stuff. I, and I, and that's, a, that's an honest thing. A lot of people do not oftentimes tap that aspect of the mantle that's on my life. Um, I didn't know that I had a mantle to, to make good business decisions until I started having to make them. Um, and in one real sense, the church is business. I, I, we have to, I have to make good business decisions all the time. Okay, and Part of making good business decisions is having, a good, uh, having wise counsel. Okay, Well, there's some things that I don't know. I'm on the phone with Apostle A. Hey, sir. Tell me what's going on here. Okay. So, yeah. Have a, and also, Tyler, have uh, a lot of counselors. Have a lot of people that are, that know God for real, not just claim to know him, but know God for real, that can give you some, that can give you wise counsel on things. All right. And, and ultimately, hear the voice of the Lord a lot about your business. Hear the voice of the Lord a lot about your business. Okay. Give me all that. Well, y'all at, bring them on, bring them on, bring them on. Elder Murphy challenged me with a theological question. You need to go get a theology degree. Somewhere he's shaking his head, no. I don't blame him. <laughs> I don't blame him at all. Theology is not a difficult subject matter. It, it, it's a subject matter nonetheless. It's not, this is not a, it's not a difficult one. Not a difficult subject matter at all. Okay. Do we have any more? Where y'all at now? Apostle, this is Ashonda. Hey, you. Hey, how are you? I am well. That's wonderful. 
So um, last year around this time, we had started with the family prayer, Mm -hmm. uh, the family prayer, and it had a lot of decrees and declarations in it. And a lot of stuff I felt like was traumatic, tragically happening in the family, but I felt a lot of things breaking off for our family. Mm -hmm. Um, But in my process of dealing with my intimacy and my sonship, I haven't been able to like um, dissect, you know, all, the whole process of what's happened in the last year mm-hmm. with my family. Yeah, you know, I'm able to go in not so more so like the orphan. I I remember feeling like, but still just lost because I just there's so many questions. I mean, like I don't even say the. Uh, family prayer anymore because it was so many different things to happen back to back to back and really my question was just like do you think it was a prayer that was on our my level that's a good question um here we go when we start th- talking about tragedies and things that happen okay and when you start praying and tragedy starts happening. That literally means that hell is trying to get people out of the way of that particular prayer because they, there's the potentiality, the very strong potentiality that those people will be rescued by it. So when hell starts to act up in a family to cause division and things of that nature, the one aspect of it is to bring is to bring uh, uh, um, a discouragement to the individual that's praying. That's one design. Because if we can get you discouraged and you stop, then you stop praying and everything goes back, you know, cool. And you're like, well, the prayer, I prayed it and this happened, but not, wait a minute, hold on. When you start to pray and make decrees and declarations, you get hell ruffled up. You stir it up. Okay, you're letting it know that you're no longer st- standing for what it has done. And so now hell has to come back and say, we're going to try to stop you and discourage you. No, no, no. Don't stop. Keep going. Standing in your sonship, standing in your authority, standing in your in your position, and making those decrees and declarations, and releasing the angels of the Lord to go forth, okay, and cause that stuff to come to pass. Another part of making decrees and declarations is going to the courtrooms of heaven, because sometimes the enemy has legal rights to people in your family, not because you gave them to them, but because they did. Okay? And we got to go back and hear the accusations from the courts of heaven and snatch this stuff back. Okay? Snatch this stuff back. Take back the legal rights that the enemy has stolen from us. Get divine, get verdicts from the courts of heaven to begin to go in and to do and to, and to counterman and, over, and overthrow and overrule and dismantle all the stuff that he's done. There are things that are operational in our families and they are there. They are there by virtue of the fact that they have legal right to be there. And those decrees and declarations, when you first start doing them, they're going to unsettle the stuff, okay? Because power is coming in, okay? They're unsettling some things, all right? And so now, if you continue to do it, you'll start to see the results because hell knows that I'm not playing with it. All right. Anytime you always you always heard me say I'm gonna make hell pay, and that's just one of them services that everybody be laid on the floor because it knows that if you make an attack like that against me, I'm just gonna come harder because I understand that the attack wasn't necessarily that that the attack was trying to get me to not come back. Okay, and at some level we're gonna need to become offensive. Okay, we're gonna need to be on the offense. We're going to need to start attacking hell before it attacks our families. Okay, we're going to have to need we're going to need to start uh, praying for our babies before they start going out and doing crazy stuff. So that while we're praying for them beforehand, then bam, when 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 the, when they're when they're met with the choices, the spirit of the Lord can now arrest them and guide them. I learned that the hard way. I didn't start praying for my son to come out of some stuff or some stuff not to come on him until I seen him in it. So now it's that hard, it's that much more hard because now I'm praying against this man's will. 
I'm praying against his will. And so the Holy Ghost told me, he said, you waited too late, player. <laughs> Can you imagine how I felt when he said that? So now I have to, I have to amend, I have to amend my prayer and how I how I address prayer or how I address prayer for him. Because now it's no longer let me decree and declare over his life. I got to go read what's in this book of destiny and decree and declare what God has written of him now. It's no longer a decree that daddy wants. It's the decrees and declarations that have been written of him. And when I decree and declare those, his life, his course, his path now begins to bend its way back to that. And, and, and in then now I can begin to pray against the things that are coming against him so that he could have a sound enough mind to make the right enough decisions to follow God's path and not another pathway. Okay, keep making those decrees and declarations. You are a strong woman of God, even though, even, even though tragedy struck, even though tragedy struck, guess what? It wasn't because it, it wasn't because you made decrees and declarations. Because hell wanted to really rock your family with some things that have taken place with you all. Okay, continue to make decrees and declarations because the more you make them, that's the more you establish a, a wall of defense and protection around your family so that the enemy will not be able to come up against them. Okay, you're taking a stand as somebody with constituted authority in your family and say, I will not tolerate what you're doing in my family. I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that every person in my family will come to a saving knowledge of the, of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I decree and declare that there will not be any, any addictions in my family. There will not be any premature deaths in my family, but continue to decree it, okay? Continue to decree it. But also, we want you to think about uh, when, you, when, 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 think, when, when decrees and declarations don't go our way, and even when we don't have answer prayer, we need to go through something called grief recovery because we don't know how to grieve losses. If you think the funeral is the only thing that makes you grieve or death is the only thing that makes you grieve, it, no, when you lose a job, you lose a friend, there's a grief process that you need to go through so that you can handle it and deal with it okay and so your soul will not be bruised and wounded and you won't have soul issues, okay? then you'll know how to continue to function, all right? So when we have, uh, when we have prayers, when we have prayers that are, uh, what's the word I wanna use? When we have prayers that are being released out of our mouths and we, 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 have, we hit one of those rough passage, patches and it doesn't go the, exactly the way that we th thought it should go, we then now have to come back with and all things will work together for the good of them that love the Lord, now they're called according to his purpose, okay? And once you hit that and go through that grief recovery, you become okay so that you know how to see from the perspective of God why things went the way that they did. May not have been his will, but it was a lot, It was sanctioned by him. But why was it, why was it sanctioned? Was it because I didn't hit that, the courts of heaven and deal with some stuff? Or was it because this person had an open case against him in the courts of heaven that I could not touch. Those are the things here. Okay, Auntie asked the question, if we're able to understand that war is an actual widespread armed conflict between political communities and therefore defined as an arm of political violence, does this mean between the kingdom of God and darkness of Hillel? Yes, ma'am. So we have to use our, 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 our warfare dialect correctly using the right words absolutely we got to use the right words uh, uh, and this is why I, I made it a point to really kind of share a lot about the vocabulary I'm, I'm very big on vocabulary because to have the right vocabulary means to have a have a complete have a proper understanding of the term and to have a proper understanding of the term means that you have proper usage of the term okay and you know how to hit that thing appropriately and correctly all right, that's the criticality of that. That's the criticality of that. So yes, it is an armed conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of, of Hillel, all right? And literally, as we are beginning to, as we're engaging warfare, we need to understand that sometimes we're not in a full-fledged battle. Sometimes we're in a skirmish, but what's that? Sometimes we're, we're, uh, 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 we're, we're in, we're, we have some collateral damage. Well, what's that? Okay, when God is trying to, when God is taking territories, the enemy and, and collateral damage means that that stuff around 
the, the target is now impacted. Is that what he wants? Or what happens when there's friendly fire? Okay. Those are, those are terms that we need. Once we understand those terms, then you'll understand the moves that you can make and how you can make them. Okay. Right. What we got. Y'all got me for a good 15 more minutes. Make use of it. Um, I had a question. Um, so how do you know when you're in the right timing of something? Like in the timing of the Lord? Or just... basically. Okay. Um the timing of the Lord, I think one of the critic one of the ways to really ascertain is to say, okay, Holy Spirit, am I am I the right am, am I in the right place? All right. Uh but some people are just not at that place. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I read another question and kind of threw me for a second. Um, how can I answer this question? Because I got to get my mind back focused on what you're So Elder Blanks, ask your question again so my mind can refocus on it. Ah, seasons of the Lord. Okay, thank you. I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You brought it back to me. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, when you start dealing with seasons, all right, um, I guess a key to, to, to know that you are in the right season and, and right is a very subjective term. Um, correct is probably more appropriate uh, that I'm in the, in, in that I'm, uh, that I'm in the correct season. Um, that's, that's good. When I'm in the correct season, uh, well, it first starts out when I'm in correct timing is what you're asking. It first starts out with asking, when am I in the right seat? Am I, what season am I in? Because every season has a set of, of protocols and procedures that will get you through it, okay? If you're in a season where you're planting, if you're in a season of learning or whatever this that season is that the Lord Jesus Christ has named it, then what are the protocols of that season? What, what are the protocols of that season? Is this the season for me to go or is this for me to stay? And if I'm going, then in the season of going, what are what, what, what things do you want me to go on and what things do you want me to stay on? You see what I'm saying? Th those are the things that you got to ask now. So it's about asking the right questions. How do you know? Uh, first, ascertaining what season you're in. And then knowing the, pro the, the protocols of that season, that's going to get you through. And then when you ask yourself, is this the right timing to do something? That word, when it comes to ascertaining timing, you got to get in, 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 on, on the, 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 the beat of the heart of God now. Okay. Once you get on the beat of the heart of God, you will know when it is that you need to make a move. You'll be prompted by the Holy Spirit to make a move. Okay. And if there is any fear or doubt there, then that's when you're gonna be fuzzy with that. So then the next you know, stream is, okay, let me, let me fast so I can hear the Holy Spirit or let me seek prophetic voices and prophetic counsel, okay? Uh, but for the most part, you'll know when you're in the right season because or when, you're in, when you're in the right time because the Holy Spirit will tell you and give you instructions on where to go and what to do and how to do it. Okay, you'll feel a push, as it were. You'll feel a push. Um, Jasmine asked the question, how do you know when God is talking to you separately, uh, his words from, from your conscience? <laughs> uh, one of the good ways to know or to delineate between God and your conscience is the word of God itself. And this is why I tell people read every day. Don't just read to read, but read to comprehend and read to retain comprehend and retain, all right? Read to understand. And once you do that, you will have a litmus test, a, uh, a, a measure whereby which to discern, that's where discernment comes in, to discern the voice of the Lord versus your conscience. And typically, typically uh, your conscience uh, is gonna be based upon your moral standing. And if your moral standing then doesn't line up with the word of God, then that's how you know it's this is this is my conscious speaking as opposed to 
God talking. God is God's standard and what he says is always going to align with what he wants and his will and how he wants to do it, okay? Um, what are some grossly misused terms that you've noticed during warfare? Um, <laughs> I've heard people do a lot of crazy stuff in, in, uh, in an attempt to sound very deep and in an attempt to uh, <laughs> oh boy uh in an attempt to to engage warfare we're not really having a full comprehension of it i heard somebody try to bind what was that they uh take authority over healing i, I said wait a minute hold on what how do you take authority over healing <laughs> it, that comes from him i don't i don't get that you know but it was because of a misuse <laughs> It was because of a misuse and, and not just misuse, but misunderstanding of, of the terms and, and things of that nature. This is why I'm very, very, very big on what? Definitions. And then to really make sure that you understand definitions, I tell you, go in, dissect the definition, understand everything about it, put it back together in your own words and juxtapose the definitions together so that they'll have some integrity. And that way, that's how you know that you comprehend the definition. That's how you know you comprehend it, as opposed to just taking my word, not just not necessarily just taking my word for it, but that's how you know you comprehend the definition. Okay. All right. Anti, antibody else. We have anyone? Let me check the. Uh, okay. All right, there that is there. Let me press play on that. I don't know if that's uh okay, yeah. So we're we're good. We're good. Anybody else wanna wanna take us out with the last question? Anybody else? Deanna. Can you um uh, talk about or I guess define uh the concept of the kingdom hermeneutic. The kingdom hermeneutic of war? Oh, sure. Um, <sighs> hermeneutics is the, the art of interpretation of a text, whatever the text is. Um, and the hermeneutic that you utilize is the key to unlocking that text. Now, a part of the hermeneutics in general is understanding the biblical context or the biblical text in context to its original meaning or its original or the, the language and the people to, it, who, to whom it was originally spoken. Now this idea of a kingdom hermeneutic of war, uh, won't, and, I, and she's bringing in uh, uh, KD 100 stuff, I already know. She's bringing in KD 100. Uh, and this hermeneutic of war means going back and looking at the text from the perspective of the king from the perspective of his kingdom. Well, uh, Miles Monroe talked about this whole idea of kings like this, like to expand their kingdom. And that's done through war. And so when you go back and I go, when, when you go back or I go back and we take a look at the book of Judges from a kingdom hermeneutic, God gives a directive in chapters one and two for them to go in and eradicate everything and they didn't do it. Most people would say, oh, okay, they were just disobedient. No, 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 no. The king wanted all of his territory and they did not secure it for him, okay? And one of the excuses was they had chariots of iron. Your God just opened up a pathway, a highway in the middle of, a, of, a, of, of water you had walls of water on the e on either side of you, and you went through not just not on muggy, wet, muddy ground. The man made sure that the ground solidified underneath your feet so that your shoes would not get mud in them. And you studying about a, a chariot of iron? Excuse me. He is more than capable. And so what that spoke of them was. We don't trust our God. The reason why God was saying to do that was because 
I don't want any insurgents raising up in my kingdom as I'm raising it up. And that's exactly what happened. As long as Joshua was alive, they were good and they followed. As soon as Joshua died, they served uh, 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 they served the Baalim, the Baals, for eight years. And, and, and God allowed them to get, you know, captured. Then the first judge was Othiniel. Othiniel comes and, you know, uh, he raises up and, and, and he gets them out. He goes and stabs the king Ehud in the stomach. The Bible says, I was reading this today, the Bible says, that when he stabbed him in the stomach with a dagger, the dirt came out of him. My God. He said he was fat. He said the dirt came out of him. But when you look at that from a kingdom hermeneutic, I'm looking at it, I'm like, and a, war, and a warfare hermeneutic, I'm like, man, this, the Bible says the man fashioned a dagger with, with two edges, with, 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 you know, two edges. Well, guess what? That speaks to the two-edged sword, okay? So he fashioned that dagger, got it? And was able then to to go into the enemy and mm, and stab that joker all right we see strategy and tactic there all right go go try to try to read read, read that tonight read uh uh is it three hold on i'm in my office so i'll be able to see uh i think it's three yeah uh yeah it's three yeah othiniel then it was ehud i'm sorry Ehud uh, was the was the next judge after him after Othiniel, and and Ehud killed Eglon. He killed Eglon, and then after Eglon, there was Shamgar. All right, and Shamgar was was a small was one verse. Okay, but there's so much that you can get out of Shamgar. Shamgar slew six hundred Philistines with an ox gold. Okay, that was a, a pointed device. A device with a with a pointy tip on it. He just started stabbing him with it. However, he did it. But it's letting you know that these guys had some had some some basic weapons that they were able to utilize again in the fight against hell. Does that make sense to everybody? You know, he was able to he was able to do that. So looking at that hermeneutic and the hermeneutic of the kingdom, uh looking at judges, says the Bible itself from the hermeneutic of the kingdom. Uh we can go back to, to Exodus and, and, and look at that and say, okay, uh, God wants to, wants to liberate his nation. That's exactly what he does. Uh, then by Exodus, uh, and also in Exodus, God wants to train his nation in who he is and who he is not and what you should and should not do. It was, it was citizenship 101. It was naturalization 101. He gets them over to the promised land. And next thing you know, well, man, thank you, ma'am. You know, he says, this is that now begin to follow what I asked you to do. Go in and they follow what he asked him to do and they don't kill everybody off. And so next thing you know, you have an insurrection. And so now God has to worry, has to deal with the insurrection in his kingdom. So I hope that helped. I took the long way around with that. Okay. Anybody else that wants to get, have a crack at a question? Give me one more question. Before I have I... one. Go ahead. Have... Um, did you get to see that um, news video I sent you about um, the annexation? I heard about it. I haven't had the opportunity to watch it just yet. I thought it was very interesting. As you're teaching on um, annexation, they're over into the land doing the same thing by how opposition is coming up against them. And despite what everything everybody else is saying to stop them from doing, they're persisting anyway. Mm -hmm. And so my thing was by any means necessary. And all I can think about was taking over the territories that you were speaking of, even with the opposition. So when you watch it and see it, you, you see what I was meaning by that. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, annexing territories. We, we, there has to be a level of, like you said, there has to be a level of consistency with it. You cannot give up on the annexation of territory. You just can't. I'm sorry. You, you just cannot. You have to keep going. You have to know that the territory belongs to you. It belongs to you. All right. 
and you have to push until you see it in manifestation. See, people don't understand. When we when we call the names of God, we talk about Jehovah Nisi. Y'all know Jehovah Nisi is the banner of, we say the banner of victory, but it really means the pennant that says, this is whose kingdom we're a part of. 